in the cloud for now. Okay, um, so we can begin here. Um, welcome everybody uh, to this webinar and addressing the LibreText project. Um, my name is Delmar Larson. I am the founder and the executive uh, director of the project. Uh, and we have a range of URLs that are on this front page here uh, of the presentation that you can uh, go to in order to find new information, uh, including uh, our website, Facebook, and Twitter. And we also have several group IO uh, pages that we use in order to facilitate dissemination and also construction efforts. Uh, and we have a new blog that is just coming out uh, and should have an entry within the next day or two that's available for people who are interested. So uh, let me uh, get this thing going. Um, <clears throat> so this is a general overview of uh, how the, uh, the proposal and actually more specifically how the presentation is gonna go here. Uh, uh, discuss who we are, what we are, and more specifically what we're not. Uh, modes of usage of using the LibreText and discuss a, a specific thrust that we've been pushing uh, for the last couple of months uh, involving uh, our opinion of OER fragmentation and how we're gonna to try to address that uh, of the system. Uh, our funding is, uh, we received a, a sizable grant uh, last, year uh, from the Department of Education uh, uh, and OER a pilot award, which we're quite uh, fortunate to receive, but we've also received funding from National Science Foundation two grants from the Director of Undergraduate Education. And we have some uh, additional funding from uh, other sources, including uh, Merlot and the Affordable Learning Solutions of the Cal State University System. Uh, and then uh, UC Davis, the Provost Office and the library also provides us uh, support in order to uh, pursue what we're doing here. So. <clears throat> Let me start out by actually showing a, a photograph of my father's truck. Um, and there's a reason why I'm emphasizing this. And that's because my father had a range of uh, different trucks uh, when I was growing up. Uh, and uh, in many of these trucks, I actually had to live in. Um, so this was a truck that I had lived in uh, for a period of time. And this is important because the, the truck itself, uh, or I was able to get out of this poverty uh, uh, because of affordable, affordable education. Uh, and that includes not just tuition, but also textbooks. Uh, and as a faculty member um, that was able to step out of this, uh, I was able to recognize that while I wasn't capable in order to address tuition costs, I was able to address uh, the textbook costs. Uh, and that is a guiding principle uh, behind how we're moving forward uh, in the project, but it's also a major motivation for uh, my involvement in the project and why I'm committed to, to the success of OER in general and the LibreText project in specific. So uh, let me start with the mission statement. So the mission statement um, as with all mission statements, was formulated um, over multiple weeks, uh, and this is the outcome of it. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to read over it uh, other than emphasizing a few uh, aspects in that the LibreText uh, project is a cooperative project or a collaborative project across multiple faculty or multiple campuses involving multiple faculty and students um, and experts outside of academia contributing in order to move the project forward uh, toward the central goal of uh, developing developing an easy to use online platform uh, that is used for construction, customizing and dissemination of OER, uh, open educational resources, uh, with the central goal of reducing the burdens of uh, unnecessary or unreasonable textbook costs, um, feeling that that's detrimental to our educational mission. So um, I probably don't have to mention this, but I want to do so uh, anyways. Uh, in, in the OER community, uh, we have a constitution, and that constitution is essentially the five R's uh, that uh, David Wiley uh, pushed out uh, early last decade um, that underlies uh, uh, basically the aspects of how we move forward, uh, involving the ability of making materials that we can retain, we can reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. Um, and the LibreText project uh, is envisioned in order to essentially take each of these aspects uh, and bring it to the extreme. Uh, so we're optimizing that, and the way we're pursuing that is by a central uh, platform that uh, gives us the capabilities of doing all these things effectively, and hopefully by the end of this presentation you will uh, agree with me. We have several advisory board uh, boards. We have a general one and we have an industrial one. Um, you may uh, recognize some of the uh, individuals on our general advisory board uh, members. <coughs> uh, 
uh, that come from uh, a range of OER uh, backgrounds off of it. Um, and let me just talk about the, the three principal aspects of uh, the LibreText project. This should really be four because we just expanded it recently. Um, we are used as a curating repository of living content. In fact, we're the largest on the net, most visited on the net, the highest ranked of, of an OER textbook project on the net. Um, and I, I want to emphasize what exactly is living content. Well, living content is content that is easy uh, in order to edit uh, in a simplistic form. Um, but more importantly, has the ability in order to be able to curate the content uh, as it moves forward in order to address issues or to advance issues. Uh, the opposite of living would be dead. And that would be, for example, a set of a reposit or repository that's full of PDFs, for example. Anyone has ever tried to uh, edit a PDF or use it productively, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, alternatively, uh, the LibreText is used as a construction dissemination platform. Um, in fact, uh, we distribute hundreds of textbooks uh, and uh, customize remixes for individual faculty at individual campuses. Uh, and then uh, the LibreText, uh, because it's an online system, provides an opportunity in order to uh, engage in student assessment or performance tools, basically learning analytics. Uh, and you can also run studies in order to ask uh, about the effectiveness of uh, various approaches uh, from a uh, a SOTL or science and technology and learning uh, approach. So again, we're a construction platform. We're also a publishing platform where we're able to generate physical copies. And I'll mention that uh, uh, near the end of this presentation. Uh, we're a dissemination platform uh, and then we're a usage educational platform. Um, I'm not sure why I have this slide again. <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned uh, in the mission uh, statement, uh, this is a collaborative effort. Uh, we welcome everyone with open arms uh, that has a desire in order to move the project forward. Uh, the uh, Department of Education grant that we received uh, involved 12 different faculty, sorry, 12 different campuses uh, and uh, over 60 faculty uh, across multiple states. Um, we also have uh, faculty that have been contributing to the project that are not explicitly named in the grant uh, as uh, contributors or adopters um, uh, <coughs> that moves the project forward. And this also includes uh, multiple community colleges uh, uh, such as Diablo Valley College, uh, the rest of the Contra Costa Community College District, Los Rios uh, Community College District, uh, and um, uh, Prince George's Community College District. So let me give you a slight perspective of, of how we approach textbooks. Um, so it, it's clear to us that the textbook of the future is not the textbook of the past or, or even the textbook of the present. Uh, and it's not entirely clear what the textbook of the future is, uh, but we wanna be able to create a platform that has the capabilities in order to build that textbook, uh, realize it, uh, and then uh, more importantly, uh, construct it in such a way that it satisfies that five R's constitution uh, that was mentioned before. Um, so I believe that uh, we need to stop thinking about building individual textbooks, um, whether OER uh, or commercial, uh, and we need to start thinking about building uh, OER text libraries. Uh, and I emphasize this quite clearly, uh, hopefully, uh, in that when we have our students graduate from their profession um, or their education, um, including bachelor's degrees or associates, we want uh, in their brain that they're able to take all the content that they learned in different silos across multiple classes and bring them together so that the, it's better than the sum of the parts. So we want a certain synergy that's connected on, the, on it. And, and that's difficult in order to do when you, when you give individualized textbooks. Um, so we focus on building libraries, um, for example, the chemistry library, which is the first library uh, that was under construction in our platform when it was originally called the ChemWiki. Uh, and then we expand it to other libraries, including biology. Uh, but more importantly, we were able to make a connection between chemistry and biology uh, that's available and then make it to agriculture and medicine. And you could bring statistics, humanities and social sciences and physics and uh, geology and engineering and photosciences and math. Um, <clears throat> and this is the, the infrastructure that we have where we have 12 libraries and we just introduced a 13th one earlier this week dealing with uh, a Spanish translation that gives us the ability in order to present a more holistic picture of uh, education. Uh, and I believe that 
by formulating the textbooks within this infrastructure of a library where you're able to mix and match and jump from one library to another library, it mirrors what we want the students to actually have developed in their brain after the educational uh, experience. So again, uh, our takeoff of doing this thing is to focus on building integrated online platform. This is in contrast to a more decentralized infrastructure that other uh, organizations pursue. Um, and this provides a variety of uh, benefits. Uh, one is it's the ease of dissemination. So once we actually construct content or we bring content into our site, then everyone uh, uh, that has access to the internet has automatic uh, access to the content that we put in. Uh, I already mentioned that we can then integrate content over multiple subfields or across different fields. Uh, and an example of that would be, for example, a student that is taking or learning enzymology in the biology library. Now, in order to really master enzymology, you need to master chemical kinetics in the chemistry library. But in order to really master chemical kinetics, you need to have some mastery of differential equations, ordinary differential, separable differential equations in the math library. Uh, and there are plenty of examples of how things are connected uh, uh, so that the understanding is much greater when you look at the, uh, how they're all put together rather than individualized. Uh, and that is a key aspect that we push uh, off of our site. Um, uh, the libraries themselves within the LibreText are uh, hosted in a wiki-based infrastructure, uh, which is technology is ideal for collaborative construction efforts and highly distributed construction efforts. So individuals can be at different campuses and uh, contribute uh, in order to move a specific textbook forward um, in terms of filling a gap analysis. Um, and that right there then provides a mechanism in order to grow uh, and take advantage of uh, the community's uh, capabilities in order to contribute to OER efforts in general. Um, and that's been really quite uh, successful uh, uh, for our project and for other many other wiki-based infrastructures like Wikipedia, for example. Uh, we have a mechanism in order to uh, generate PDFs. So while we have an online platform, uh, we have capabilities in order to do things offline where you can take the PDF and you can print them up yourself. Uh, we uh, are just coupling in with uh, Lulu and Amazon in order to provide uh, physical copies of textbooks for faculty and students that feel that they don't want to access things online but want a physical uh, copy. Uh, we are working on an online homework system uh, and more importantly, uh, to have that adaptive so that uh, it can provide a virtual tutor of sorts uh, to address uh, uh, needs in the students' uh, educational experience. Um, <clears throat> we have three-dimensional capabilities uh, where we're able to interact with molecules, uh, proteins three-dimensionally, uh, and that makes uh, the educational experience or at least the education itself uh, of students uh, in these things much uh, easier. Uh, we have multimedia capabilities. We can include videos, we can include simulations like FET simulations, uh, Concord consortium simulations and other simulations uh, that uh, are currently being constructed. As long as it could be hosted on a website, we can then embed it into our system and then everybody would then have the opportunity in order to uh, take advantage of uh, it once we brought it in. We've just integrated numerical calculation infrastructure, which is based off of a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so that it, it lets us embed executable code um, like Python code or R code, uh, Sage Math and um, Octave are the four languages that we have selected. Although we have access to 30 different languages that the Jupyter infrastructure has. And so you can imagine this is useful uh, if you're taking a, a statistics class and in order to really master statistics, you need to manipulate the data in order to get an understanding of the various properties that you get from uh, interpreting the data. Um, so, you could, uh, so we have been working on upgrading the statistics textbooks where you can actually have R as a code uh, uh, that you can then run with data and manipulate it directly in the textbook. Uh, and again, this uh, advances this argument that I'm saying that the textbook of the future is no doubt gonna be very different from the textbook of the past. And we're very excited about that uh, aspect. Uh, our project uh, is a usage-based project where we're also able to track individual students' interactions with uh, the textbook and also the homework infrastructure. Uh, so we can actually do assessment and ask, uh, is the approach that we are doing by bringing in the numerical infrastructure, the multimedia or other aspects, really in fact improving education, which is ultimately our goal, not just to make things uh, cheaper for uh, students.
We've also integrated uh, two annotation systems. Uh, one's Hypothesis, the other one is Nota Bene. Uh, the first one is from uh, San Francisco, the second one is uh, from uh, MIT. And it gives the ability for faculty and students to actually move their chat room, if they're using a chat room in their learning management system, into their textbook. So you can provide marginalia, capability of writing marginalia, and then essentially have a meta discussion on the side of a of a page between the faculty and the students or faculty of faculty. Uh, and that can oftentimes be quite uh, uh, more engaging uh, in order to read than the actual content. Uh, but anything that gets the students engaging into uh, or engaged with the material uh, is a plus uh, from our perspective. So this is a general organization of a library. Uh, some libraries have not gotten all four of these uh, snapshots. Uh, or entries off of them, um, but they will eventually. So we have uh, <coughs> our campus courses, and that is uh, basically individual campuses that will then have faculty in multiple, one or multiple courses, uh, and it acts as a course shell of sorts, but it's more of a sandbox where the faculty can construct whatever they want in order to be able to uh, advance the textbook needs that they have uh, and do it without it being coupled to anyone else's contributions or um, the other resources that we have, including the bookshelves. And the bookshelves are where we store our texts. We actually have two texts typically in bookshelves. One are text books and the other ones are text maps. So textbooks are content that's either constructed by our team or content that we brought into our team that's attributed to a specific author and uh, you can go to that uh, textbook and you can copy it as you need uh, but more importantly uh, it's a unique source of material. Um, the other flavor of these things would be remixes um, where you're able to slice and dice content in order to be able to construct your own customized version. We make, uh, we make text maps, which are textbooks that are essentially remixes uh, that follow existing commercial textbooks. So if a faculty member especially likes a specific organization of a textbook that they've adopted, a commercial textbook, we can actually build a text map in order to follow what they're doing and then makes a seamless, or as seamless as we can, transition from commercial to OER. It's one of our more successful approaches for doing things. Uh, but they are oftentimes quite time consuming uh, uh, text to make. We have uh, homework uh, stored in the homework area where we have our problems uh, and that's also where we're going to be coupling in a lot of the digital uh, online homework infrastructure uh, when it comes into play which we're still beta testing right now but um, but we've gotten quite positive results. Uh, and then we have the ancillary material, which is basically everything else uh, and that includes a range of different materials depending upon uh, the the maturity of the library and the content that we've integrated uh, to that date. So that may include uh, slide decks, uh, maybe include work uh, sheets, uh, visualizations, and other aspects that you can integrate into it. The key point uh, is that when a faculty member wants to build a sandbox, uh, for their class, a textbook that's customized for the, for the class, they can essentially grab from any of this content and mix and match in order to suit their individual needs. And invariably that also in, involves going through various uh, subsections in this hierarchy in order to, to do so. So we have a, uh, a download center that we are working on. Uh, uh, and if this button works out right, uh, this is a smaller version of it. Uh, <clears throat> and the download center uh, it, it gives us the ability in order to uh, take a specific textbook, and these are just four examples of it. Uh, so this is a, a earlier version of what we have. Um, for example, the 2BH class that I'm currently teaching at UC Davis, uh, General Chemistry for Honors. Uh, and I can come in and I can download uh, up to five different things here. I can view it online, which is not really downloading. I can download a PDF of it. I can download a, a common cartridge entry in order to embed this uh, textbook into my uh, learning management system, um, for example, Canvas or any other one that we use. We can get a zip file of, of every single page that is in that textbook uh, for remixing off of our system. Uh, and then we can provide the, uh, the files in order to upload to Lulu in order to um, to get a print version of that. And we're working on an Amazon uh, storefront in order to make it easier for students and faculty to just go and click on a button and pay the printing costs and get the actual physical copy itself. Uh, and it, this is a, the general argument, uh, general theme that we're gonna have for all the download centers. Uh, so um, 
<coughs> so uh, we, I mentioned that the LMS interface uh, is via common cartridge, but we'll also have LTI interface, uh, learning technology interoperability protocols, uh, which gives us a deeper interface to learning management systems. Uh, uh, we are gonna have uh, EPUB capabilities soon. Um, and I mentioned that we can professionally bind a book. Um, uh, you can get a soft bound version of a 550 page book for uh, $12 if it's in black and white. Uh, if you want the creme de la creme book uh, that's hardbound and color, that would be about $30. We're, st we're still talking uh, one tenth of the price of a textbook, a uh, commercial textbook. Uh, and again, none of that money comes to us. That's directly uh, paying the uh, publisher for it. So, um, this is a really exciting time for OER. Um, a lot of people are getting involved in it, uh, and it's really great. Um, and there are a lot of repositories uh, out there uh, in order to find content. For example, the Open Textbook Library has a wide, has over 600 uh, uh, entries in their repository. You know, we are Commons and OpenStax and Merlot and OpenSunny and Galileo and uh, Open Oregon and Nova and BC Campus and uh, eCampus Ontario and I don't remember it's e Alberta uh, and then Hawaii uh, and then Sailor uh, and this is just a small snippet of uh, the, the content uh, of repositories out there that, that hold or will direct uh, users to OER content. And this doesn't even take into account uh, the uh, individual faculty that may have uh, what would be OER content that they're hosting on their website uh, and a lot of other projects out there that would be filling here. So uh, the point of emphasizing this is that uh, OER has become a very uh, decentralized, fragmented uh, situation right now. Uh, and there are benefits in order to do that, but there are detractions. And the detraction uh, that I want to emphasize here is that it's oftentimes difficult in order to find content. And so while a lot of people are contributing and building content off of there, if the content is not coordinated uh, effectively, that many times we're duplicating effort, which I think is detrimental. Uh, and more importantly, if you're trying to find content is particularly difficult. Um, so uh, there's even more people <laughs> off of it. So uh, there's been this cottage industry that's popped up oftentimes by librarians uh, that are well-skilled in order to be oracles. And oracles um, uh, are individuals that have the ability in order to know where content is and being able to find that content. Uh, and they're exceedingly important uh, with the current state of affairs for OER. Um, but my opinion uh, or our stance here is that uh, a lot of effort is dedicated in, into developing these skills uh, and a lot of time is invested into being able to find the content through the individuals that have these skills. Um, so we would like to make it so that uh, the oracles are out of business of oracling. Um, uh, so we want them, uh, we want the effort to be dedicated in construction and customizing uh, rather than finding content. And there are two ways in which we can proceed in order to do that. One is to content, uh, connect all that OER content that I showed uh, before and, and everywhere else into a central system in order to be able to identify where things are. Um, that is particularly uh, awkward in order to implement. The, the approach that we have decided to take was to take advantage of the reuse, remix uh, infrastructure uh, that underlies OER and uh, it essentially aggregate, uh, or uh, we use the term harvest, in order to bring content into our system uh, and, uh, and then typeset it and, and make it uh, all available for everyone to then harvest from our content. So in that case, there's an aggregation of sorts or an integration. Um, that's beneficial for a, a variety of reasons. Um, so you could think of this if you're into Star Trek, it's something similar to Borgifying, um, uh, although uh, maybe not nearly as aggressive as we'd like it to be here, um, but it's essentially sharing. Um, and it's one of the premise of the uh, OER community. Um, and uh, it, we, we uh, integrate content into our our repository. And a lot of the effort that we're doing is essentially uh, taking content that may be dead, like PDFs, and making them alive. Um, so we have a developing team of uh, currently 60 undergraduate student developers, although we're expanding it to 100, that will go through PDFs uh, and other repositories of content, bring them in, uh, we will rip them apart, uh, and then reconstitute them in a same 
uh, standard type set that we've formulated into our system. Uh, and then uh, that enables us to uh, identify how things are linked together. Uh, and to facilitate that, we add uh, meta tags for content at the page level, not the textbook level. Um, and it provides a mechanism uh, uh, in order for an expansive or a comprehensive library that faculty have access to or instructional designers to, to construct. Uh, so in other words, we want to take the Oracle uh, business out of the Oracleing, uh, and we want to provide a mechanism for faculty in order to um, capitalize on the comprehensive uh, library infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned that we have a, a lot of undergraduate students doing these things. Uh, they're particularly good for a variety of reasons. The return on investment is high, uh, and it's also pedagogical for including them in, which is always a key aspect of what we're doing here. Um, so uh, we bring content into our site, into our platform via a variety of different mechanisms. Uh, <coughs> some of them are, are customly constructed by students uh, in their classroom. This is useful for faculty that want to build an OER textbook, uh, but they don't have the resources or the time in order to dedicate to them, but they can provide the opportunity for their students in order to engage in the construction of a textbook for their class. That could be uh, either force credit or it could be extra credit, depending upon uh, how they want to proceed. Um, we have these students who also then harvest or integrate existing content from faculty that have been constructed. Um, that can happen from notes at individual campuses or it can happen from taking from repositories, referatories that we showed before. Uh, we expect by the end of this uh, upcoming summer to have all the major, uh, all the content from the major referatories uh, that were shown before integrated into our system typeset uh, and put together. Uh, and then we also have faculty constructors uh, on our team in order to fill in uh, the gaps that are constructed or that, that we've identified. Um, one of the benefits that we get from integrating things into our library and making this comprehensive approach is it makes it much easier for us to do a gap analysis uh, and identify what needs to be constructed and what does not um, uh, or, or what and, and then obviously how to fill that thing. So <clears throat> We have uh, uh, several teams uh, in our project in order to move things forward. Uh, one is our content development team. Uh, and we have this uh, flow chart, uh, and the details are not overly important here, but the key point is that we want to make functioning OER textbooks. Uh, and we intend on making a range of them uh, across all 12 of our libraries uh, as part of our deliverables for our grant. And we're going to be quite active in doing that over the summer when the faculty have the opportunity in order to do that outside of their teaching obligations. Um, um, and we have a gap analysis approach in order to, to fill in this, this aspect. But the key point is that when you have an existing library infrastructure that's big, you can use that as uh, raw material uh, in order to construct new textbooks. Sometimes they may be similar to the original material in the library, but oftentimes they may be completely different and we're picking and choosing things. But by bringing the content into our library and having the same uh, typesetting uh, associated, it facilitates greater interactions or, or uh, strong longer remixing capabilities. Um, uh, in contrast, you can imagine trying to do something like that with a series of PDFs, and that's an exercise in uh, futility oftentimes because of the way the PDF infrastructure doesn't facilitate uh, remixing. We have a harvesting team. Um, which consists of uh, two sub teams, one that focuses on integration. Those are those uh, undergraduate students that we have. Uh, and we have a team uh, outside of uh, Sacramento City College uh, who runs a pre-harvesting team, which is essentially a gap analysis team using faculty in order to identify what needs to be filled in um, and what textbooks uh, they can construct for their individual um, campus that can then be leveraged to other uh, aspects. A key point here again is, is this general theme that uh, we bring content in from our libraries for the gap analysis um, and if they find content that's necessary uh, in order to uh, build the gap analysis that's outside of our libraries then we will identify that content and bring it into our system uh, with the harvesting team. Um, the harvesting team is a very active team uh, in our project to FARP. So the, the whole point here is to create um, a storeroom uh, of educational content that's uh, uh, 
processed in the same format and it's easy for a faculty member or instructional designer to come in and say, I want a little bit of this, I want a little bit of that, and I want a little bit of that and bring it all together into a customized textbook in order to suit the needs of that faculty member or campus or department uh, uh, off of that. So uh, to that end, uh, we need to construct a mechanism in order to take advantage of this comprehensive no gap left behind a, a, a library that we are uh, building. Uh, so we constructed uh, what we refer to as the OER remixer. Um, and the OER remixer um, looks like this. Um, if you like, uh, let me uh, go to uh, the first page here. Um, it, uh, and I could show you uh, how to go about remixing it, and you can do it yourself uh, by uh, logging in with this uh, account, uh, uh, username remix and password I love remixing explanation point. Um, and if you like, I can uh, put that into the chat window. And when you do that, you have this cap this uh, resource uh, when you actually uh, uh, go to any, go to the chemistry page, for example, and you look under the URL remixer, it will go to this remixing uh, page. And we're very excited about this remixer uh, because it gives a, a great utility in order to take advantage of this comprehensive library that we're constructing. Now, uh, before we can use the remixer, we need to construct a remixing map, um, which I have not uh, uh, shown here. Um, but a remixing map looks something like this. I'm gonna grab a remixing map from uh, Lubbock Christian College. <clears throat> and essentially, before you can go into remixing, you need to know what it is that you want uh, to build. Uh, and this is oftentimes a big barrier for faculty in order to, to do, because we're not uh, oftentimes familiar with uh, having, or at least comfortable with having full control over every, uh, the textbook. But again, uh, a common a mantra that we have is that you don't have control of your curriculum, you don't have control of your textbook. Um, so they came in uh, at Lubbock Christian College and they decided they wanted to make a textbook uh, and they organized uh, their textbook by chapter one, they have a title for it, uh, and they numbered them uh, and they say, I want this uh, page and this page, and it comes from different resources. This is a chemistry textbook, but it can apply to any textbook. Uh, and they've constructed essentially a what we refer to as a text, uh, a re, a, a, a remixing map uh, it, that guides them off of how they want to uh, build it. So once you have a remixing map, you are then able to go into the remixer and build that map. And it's oftentimes anticlimactic because it, it happens so quickly that you, you're not actually engaged with the remixer uh, too much. So for example, let's build a textbook. Um, uh, and I uh, can do that in chemistry. Um, but I can do it in any libraries that we want. Uh, I'm going to call this uh, uh, introductory chemistry textbook. And on this side is essentially all the libraries that we have access to. Um, and in this case here, we're starting with chemistry because it happens to be the library that I put it here. But you can start with any of the 12 libraries that has the same remixer uh, on it. And then you have uh, over here uh, the blank pages that we have available. So how can we use the remixer effectively? Uh, well, there is the simple thing. Let me just erase uh, uh, everything over here and say, I want to make, I'm a faculty member and I want to make a textbook for my class uh, so I can customize it. And let's say I just want to grab um, uh, everything from this textbook here. So you just drag and drop. Uh, uh, And that's fine and dandy, but then you can go in and you can say, well, I really don't like this page. Uh, and you'll notice as we deleted that page in that chapter, it automatically renumbers. Um, the whole point here is to try to make it as easy as possible in order to customize material. So you don't need to deal with changing numbers uh, and this uh, of the titles. And, you, and then by changing the numbers of the titles, we also change the equation numbers and the page numbers, not the page numbers, the um, table numbers and the figure numbers uh, in order to uh, reflect that. Uh, and that's fine, uh, but you, let's say that you also feel that you wanna have a different uh, uh, content. So you wanna grab some stuff from mathematics and let's say that you really feel that you need to have some OpenStax calculus book. Uh, so you wanna grab chapter six here and now it's grabbing it from a different library. So you can construct uh, these new remixes um, uh, from taking advantage of over uh, 100,000 pages across these 12 libraries and growing quite uh, uh, strongly. Um, and you just basically grab what you want uh, uh, all within the, um, uh, within the uh, 
remixing map that's been constructed. <clears throat> Now we've built this textbook. Uh, all we need to do is publish them and we press a button that publishes and it starts going through it. And it's only 42 pages, so it's not a particularly big textbook. And it's going step by step in order to make a new textbook that we then have access to. Now, now while it's doing this, uh, it brings it into a, an area. Uh, in this case here, we named it in the University of Remixer University which is a very prestigious university, of course. And you, uh, we will generate this textbook, and then we can go into the textbook once it's completed, and we can then do editing at the page level or the paragraph level or whatever is necessary in order to be able to advance um, uh, the customization uh, goal of the project. Uh, but this is, again, uh, only the first step uh, in involvement. And here is the textbook that we've constructed, which has these various components uh, that come from different libraries. And, uh, and that is uh, the remixer. Uh, so you can take, you can use the remixer in order to build these uh, remixes. Uh, if they come from a variety of different libraries or a variety of different uh, sections, the, sometimes people call them uh, Frankensteins, uh, but they're essentially uh, completely customizable textbooks that faculty can can create uh, in order to move themselves forward uh, <clears throat> and you know and the numbering is set up uh, uh, appropriately in order to address it so uh, we can also use this in order to, to rip apart a textbook uh, for example uh, if we want to uh, clear this textbook and let's say we want to go into uh, anatomy and physiology. Um, and if you go to that, let's say you're, you're taking uh, the anatomy and physiology uh, sections and you have the, uh, this is going to take a moment, uh, we have the full uh, anatomy and physiology textbook that we have uh, from OpenStax. I'm going to merge that up. Uh, so they're all section here. And let's say that we really want to remove specific sections uh, that, uh, uh, you know, anatomy from physiology, uh, which is a little awkward with this uh, book because they're not separate areas, but you can say, well, I don't like this book, uh, this section right here. Uh, and I don't like this, actually, it's a chapter. And, and let's say I want to get rid of that one. Uh, and, and, axial chemistry. Um, so obviously this requires uh, careful thinking of, in making the uh, remixing map, uh, but uh, we've constructed this and if I publish this, it's gonna be taking a while because it's, uh, it's multiple hundreds of pages and I just won't do that. Um, I encourage uh, everyone in order to take advantage of that. Uh, again, the username and password are available here. This is a very specialized account that lets a faculty in order to remix. Uh, if a faculty member wants to construct a textbook and edit it at the textbook level they need to get an editing account and we're freely uh, they're freely available they just need to contact um, uh, anyone on the development team which you can access via um, emailing to info at libretext.org uh, in order to move it forward so um, as I mentioned, we are very excited about the OER Remixer because it provides a great opportunity in order to uh, really take advantage of the, um, <clears throat> the library infrastructure that we have created. So another way in order to look at that is this flow chart that we oftentimes show in terms of how a faculty member may want to adopt a LibreText. Uh, and the first step uh, in this process, uh, either adopting or constructing a LibreText, is essentially identifying uh, what you want as a faculty member. And this could be, as I mentioned before, a, a big barrier at times because we're oftentimes not comfortable uh, with full flexibility of the textbook. Um, so we need to identify what we want uh, and uh, once we've done that, then we have to go through a series of steps here. We recommend doing so. And the first step would be, you know, does something identical already exist in the library today? Uh, uh, if it does, uh, or bits and pieces of it already does, you can use the remixer, uh, which is essentially the equivalent of copy, pasting, and going. Uh, and that's a very simplified uh, process in order to do. And many faculty are perfectly comfortable adopting an existing textbook uh, and, and moving forward off of that. Uh, alternatively, the, if that doesn't uh, happen, um, then you have the question, does something similar exist in the library today? And if the answer is yes, we copy paste and then you edit. So you have the ability, you customize it in order to address whatever you want in order to uh, uh, realize the vision of that faculty member. The key point here is also to emphasize it because as a living content, uh, this is a, a, an evolving, continually evolving 
process. Um, so uh, the textbook is never static unless you decide not to ever update it. And then it gives you the ability in order to uh, adapt to the times, which uh, many textbooks uh, should do. So anyways, uh, let's say that there's nothing similar on the LibreText library today. Uh, and as we expand and bring in the OER universe into our system, uh, we will, um, uh, it'll be uh, less and less likely that this will be the case as we move forward. So then comes the question, does something similar exist outside of the library today? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we will uh, act as a liaison in order to uh, obtain permission, if possible, in order to bring it uh, into our library where uh, the development team will facilitate the construction efforts uh, to bring it in. Uh, and then we then provide the opportunity in order to edit it as needed. Uh, and then only after all these cases are uh, have been addressed and, and then we just can't do it, then we go into construction from scratch. Uh, so this is oftentimes what faculty think is the hardest or, or think when they think about adopting or building a textbook is that it's a lot of effort. We got to build it from scratch and this is a painful process. And, and I argue that that's actually uh, the last step uh, uh, of what's going on. Uh, you want to look at all the opportunities available uh, and that's what uh, the LibreText platform provides uh, to uh, students. And each of these levels, uh, uh, our development team is willing to work with faculty and departments in order to move it forward um, uh, off of it. So let me mention um, uh, the usage uh, aspect. So the platform has this ability in order to construct on it uh, because it's a wiki-based infrastructure uh, and I can show that editing uh, if people are interested in it. Uh, we can disseminate it by just providing a URL uh, uh, out there. Uh, we could print up copies of them, or PDFs, distribute them uh, as needed. Um, but then there's also this usage aspect. Uh, and the usage aspect uh, we're very excited about because students engage with our resource, we can then track how they uh, interact with the resource and then from that use that to guide the pedagogy. In other words, improve our educational experience beyond just, well, this is how it's always been. And this mirrors, again, this uh, argument that we're pushing that the textbook of the future is very different from the textbook of the past. And we're still not entirely sure what the textbook of the future is supposed to look like. Um, but we know we need data in order to know how it actually operates. Um, so here is the um, uh, usage of a class that was taught in a pilot uh, uh, th four years ago um, uh, that I, I taught uh, where I used the LibreText then Ken Wiki uh, in a class of 500 students. I also had a control class uh, uh, that was using the commercial textbook. Uh, and what you'll notice here in this aggregate number of page views per day is exactly when I had my exams. Uh, because the students cramped. They studied a lot the few days before the exam. Uh, so from this, we were able to identify how much uh, uh, cramming happened. Uh, and more importantly, because we were able to track students at the individual level, which is not shown here, we were then able to cross-reference how cramming had a detrimental effect on their education. Um, and what we found out was, uh, at least on performance on the exam uh, that they were cramming for, it decreased their, uh, their score on the average of 10%. Um, so based off of that feedback, uh, the summer we then uh, decided to teach a class um, that was six weeks, so it's a, it's a more accelerated uh, time frame. And then we put weekly quizzes instead of um, three exams or midterms every three weeks. Uh, and the idea was to try to get the background up uh, under the arguments that cramming is bad. Uh, we've seen this uh, approach uh, several times. Uh, if you flip a class uh, where you uh, force students in order to study outside of the class and they come in and they do exercises and homework and discussions uh, outside of conventional uh, lecturing, what we found is essentially the cramming uh, goes away or is heavily reduced. Uh, uh, and that then uh, has an increased benefit on uh, the educational experience. So you can use this as a guiding um, information. Um, the other thing is that we can also use this in order to uh, generate uh, an, uh, a, to couple into adaptive learning infrastructure and we're looking at different modalities of adaptive learning including decision tree approaches and machine learning um, as part of our award that it gives us the ability in order to identify uh, gaps in students uh, capabilities and then facilitate uh, mechanisms in order to remediate for those gaps. Um, and we're very excited about that. And we think we'll have something to present about that uh, this summer once it comes out. 
I mentioned that we have physical books. Here's a photocop, uh, a picture of uh, one of the books in the class uh, 2BH, uh, the honors 2B class that I'm teaching this quarter. Um, uh, this is the soft bound black and white version for $12. So it's a little bit more than a lunch, but not much more than a lunch. Uh, we're working on uh, other, uh, actually many other things. Uh, one uh, particular interest is internet in a box. So in many uh, approaches, uh, in terms of disseminating our content, while we push a lot uh, the power of dissemination within a central platform using the internet, we want to be able to uh, address the needs of uh, students uh, that don't have reliable high speed or even low speed internet, uh, oftentimes in developing countries or in uh, areas in America that are don't have a, a large infrastructure established. Uh, <clears throat> so to pursue that, we're working on uh, coupling our system into an internet in a box approach uh, so that you can download it as an app onto our system or you can actually uh, have a more centralized containerized approach in order to move forward uh, with accessing our content without having to uh, tap into the internet for doing so. Um, we're very excited about that. Uh, again, it satisfies uh, our desires in order to expand to equity or improving equity, uh, not just within our country, but within America, within the world. Uh, with that, uh, I will end uh, again thanking uh, the people who support our project, uh, including the Department of Education and NSF. Uh, and then we've gotten uh, funding from uh, Cal State University System with Leslie Kennedy and Jerry Hanley, uh, and Ralph Hexter's uh, UC Davis is provost, and Mackenzie Smith is the librarian that have provided us support for that project. Uh, with that, uh, I encourage anyone who has any questions regarding what I've presented or if you're interested in the sandbox or just playing around, uh, please contact us. Uh, you can contact me directly uh, at uh, dlarsonlibertex.org uh, or at info.libertex.org uh, and we will uh, set you up and uh, work with you in order to move things forward. Hopefully um, you'll share our enthusiasm uh, over the approaches that we're doing um, and uh, the future that we uh, look forward to realize with that i thank you for your attention anyone have any questions you want me to, i can go through editing uh i can address anything that people might be interested. Yeah, hi, hi delmar how's it going um oh. uh, um i had a question about your internet in a box could you expand on how that works a little bit right now we're in the central valley and we don't have internet access for a lot of our outlying communities the rural farm communities um how does that work or what's that look like moving forward because right now we're looking into buying hotspots and trying to circulate hotspots through the library and things like that. Yeah, um, so there, there's a range of technologies that are used in order to address this issue. Um, that's something that uh, I had, uh, I was not as familiar with uh, uh, last year, but uh, people uh, emphasized to me that many students come to campus, have access to internet on the campus, and then once they leave, uh, they don't have access to it. And students that obviously uh, are uh, taking online homework, uh, or sorry, online uh, courses that then may not be able to really tap into the what they need. Um, so there are two flavors that we're looking at. Uh, so one is an app um, where you uh, can install a, a system and it has downloaded the textbooks uh, via a infrastructure called Zim files, uh, which was used uh, initially for downloading Wikipedia. Uh, uh, the tech, that aspect is not overly important. The key point is that the a student uh, can download the textbook when they're on campus, uh, when they do have internet access. Um, uh, and then when they leave, they have access to it completely offline. Um, and, and that's not what we have currently, but this is what we intend on doing. Um, and the technology behind that is not overly onerous, but we just need to step through it. What is a little bit more sophisticated is going to a community where you don't have intermittent access to internet, like go being able to go to campus, where you just basically have nothing. Um, and, and that becomes a little bit more complicated because you have to somehow get the content out there. Now you can do th simple things like providing a SIM card or something like that physically with the textbooks, uh, which might be one mechanism in order to do that. Um, but this is also similar to uh, developing countries. So you can actually make a hotspot uh, of sorts where you have a central um, uh, hub <clears throat> like this uh, that you populate uh, with uh, the content uh, and you can 
download the whole database uh, across our library. Uh, and then you, the students can tap into that hotspot. Um, it's a relatively local uh, technology, uh, not super expansive, not super powerful. You could even uh, couple it in with uh, solar uh, powered uh, capabilities. Um, that, m that aspect may or may not be overly useful within the states uh, off of it. We expect to have, I was just told this morning uh, that the team that's working on this uh, has uh, successfully downloaded a chapter for their chemistry textbook. Um, this is uh, the people who are doing this are outside of the University of Arkansas Little Rock. Uh, and uh, I would suspect that we'd be able to have something operational by again, the end of the summer. Did I answer your question or was there something specific that I may No, that, that was very good, thank you. Um, so, and once they become available, when you say available, how would, like community colleges or people go about accessing or getting a hold of that? That's a good question. Uh, we are so uh, much in the infancy, we haven't uh, addressed that. Um, so it depends upon what flavor that they want, right? If it's, uh, if it's the flavor where you download the app uh, and you're able to grab that, that is relatively simple. We'll provide it in the app store that, uh, uh, that you'll, you'll go with. Okay, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, where you have no access and you need to go through a hub and, and go through that infrastructure, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm not entirely sure the best way in order to do that. Uh, we're fortunate that we're going to have an intern uh, that uh, will be working with us this summer who has been pursuing these things in Haiti. Um, uh, and uh, she has an interest in order to transition into uh, English-based uh, uh, um, advocacy for internet in a box uh, and we're we'll no doubt have a lot more uh, constructive uh, feedback um, for these sort of questions uh, um, very soon very helpful thank you mm -hmm. does anyone else have any questions want me to showcase any other aspects share any secret nuggets of what we're going to be doing in the near future Okay, well, with that, then I can uh, terminate this presentation. And I, again, encourage you uh, to contact me if you have any questions uh, at a later date. Um, and feel free to uh, email me if you want a copy of this video or a link to this video, and then we are more than comfortable sharing it. With that, thank you for attending and have a good day.